Okay, so welcome to the video. So today we're going to take a look at how to do multiple linear regression on SPSS, and then we'll take a look at how to report the results of that. So normally you're going to use multiple linear regression when you have a continuous dependent or outcome variable, and when you have two or more continuous uh, independent or predictor variables. Um, you can use binary independent variables, but it's more common to use continuous um, predictor variables. So that's what we're going to do today in the example. And we'll use multiple linear regression if you want to know whether variation in a dependent variable or outcome variable can be, can be predicted by uh, independent or predictor variables. So for, um, for this video, we're going to imagine that we've conducted a little study where we're interested in whether we can predict how often someone is late to a lecture um, within a given year by how far they live from the campus and by how far they live from their nearest train station. So let's go to SPSS and take a look at how we're going to set this up. So we can go to the variable view and we can just enter the name of the predictor variable uh, or one of the predictor variables into this top cell. So we'll enter uh, distance underscore because we can't use a space campus we'll do the same thing for the other predictor variables we'll do distance underscore train and then finally we'll enter the outcome or dependent variable so that's going to be times late which is going to represent times late to lecture so if we go to data view now we can see that these names have appeared at the top of these columns so then we can just copy and paste the data from this Excel file into the spaces beneath, uh, beneath the col columns. Um, then we can go to Analyze, down to your regression, across to Linear. Then we're just going to transfer the uh, independent or predictive variables into the independence box. And we'll transfer the dependent variable or outcome variable into the dependent box. Then we'll just tick a few boxes. So we'll go to statistics and we'll tick descriptives, collinearity, diagnostics, and covariance matrix. We'll actually also tick the Gerber and Watson box and then go to continue. In the plots section, we will go, we'll transfer the Z pred to the X bit and Z resid to the Y bit. And we'll tick normal probability plots, then go to continue. Finally, we'll go to save, we'll take Cook's value, and we'll go to continue, and then we'll go finally to OK. And so the reason we tick all these boxes is that there are lots of assumptions associated with the multiple linear regression, so we need to just check that these assumptions have been met. So one of the assumptions is that there isn't too strong of a relationship between the predictor or independent variables. So in this case, the predictive variables are distance from campus and distance from train station. So we can take a look at this correlations table. So here's distance from campus and here's distance from train station. And we can see that the correlation or the R value is minus uh, 0 0.177. And normally the cutoff for determining whether the relationship is too strong or not is uh, 0.7 either side of zero. So positive 0.7 or minus 0.7. Since this value here is closer to zero than minus 0.7, we can conclude that there isn't a problem with uh, multi-collinearity. So there isn't too strong of a relationship between the predictive variables. Um, we can also check this assumption by going down to the, the coefficients table. So we can see here these tolerance and VIF values. So we want the tolerance value to be above 0.1 and we want the VIF value to be below 10 and so we can see that that is true in this case. So that supports the, the idea uh, that the multi-collinearity assumption hasn't been violated. Uh, so we can also check the, I've actually got a checklist here. So, so we've just taken a look at this multi-collinearity assumption and we've seen that the correlation coefficient supports it and we can see that the tolerance value so that's this value here, and the VAF value supports that the assumption of multicollinearity wasn't violated. So another assumption is the values of the residuals are independent. 
And so for this one, we can check the Durban Watson value, and we want this to be between one and three. And this value is in the model summary table. <clears throat> so here's the model summary table. Here's the Durban Watson value, and we can see that that is between one and three. So we can conclude that the uh, assumption of the, the values of the residuals being independent has been met. Another assumption we need to check is the values of the residuals are normally distributed. So this one we're going to, to check this assumption, we're going to refer to this, this plot here. And basically what we want to see is that these dots uh, closely align with this, with this diagonal line, which you could argue they do in this case. So let's say that this assumption has been met. Um, similarly, we need to check a plot to check whether the, the assumption, the homoskedasticity assumption has been met. So for this one, we just want to see a basically random pattern in the scatter plot that has been generated. And I have an example of what we do want to see. So you want something random like this. So the dots are just all over the place. And you don't want to see something like this where you have like a triangle shape appearing in the dots because that would suggest that this uh, assumption of homoskedasticity has been violated. So in our case, these dots are quite randomly distributed. So we can say that this assumption has not been violated. And finally, we want to check that there are no influential cases biasing the model. So that would mean that might happen if you had um, very high or very low scores associated with uh, certain participants. Um, so you just want to check that that's not happening. And to do that, we can take a look at the Cook's value. So we want the Cook's value. So that's in the residual statistics table. And we just want to check that this maximum value is below one. So in this case, it's, it's 0.1. So it's obviously quite a lot uh, below one. So we can conclude that no cases are having an undue effect on the accuracy of the model. Okay, so those are the assumptions. So we can now get to the more interesting stuff, which is the regression analysis itself. Um, so the first thing uh, that people often check is the R square value. So this is um, in the model summary table. So in this case, it's 0.464. So that means that the the model predicts 46.4% of the variance in the dependent or outcome variable. And then if we go down to the ANOVA table, we can see that this is significant. So the model predicts a significant amount of the variance in the outcome or dependent variable. And of course, we're saying it's significant because the value is below 0.05. And in addition to checking whether the, the model which contains both the predictors is significant, we can check uh, the independent, uh, sorry, the individual uh, predictors as well. So if we go down to the coefficients table, we can see in the distance campus row here that we again have a significant p-value. So that suggests that uh, distance from campus predicts a significant amount of the variability in how often someone is late to lectures. And similarly, with the distance from the train station variable, again, this value is uh, below 0 0.05. So we can conclude that the distance someone lives from the nearest train station uh, also predicts a significant amount of variance in how often they are late to lectures. Okay, so let's take a look at how to report these results. Uh, we'll take a quick look at how to um, report the, the assumption checks first. So the first one we're looking at is uh, there was a um, we calculated the Pearson correlation coefficient, and this gave us a coefficient of minus 0.18. So just to recap, we got that from this correlations table here, and so this value of minus 0.177 has just been rounded up to minus one uh, one eight, and we've argued in this in this paragraph here that that suggests that the assumption of multi-collinearity was not violated. And we've just done the same thing for tolerance and the VIF values. So we've just reported these 
and indicated that these also suggest that the assumption of multicollinearity was not violated. So just to recap, if these values come from here, and again, they've just been rounded to two decimal places. So next we can go to the Durbin-Watson statistic. So this checks the assumption that the values of the residuals are independent. And we have suggested that the statistics suggest that this assumption has not been violated. And just to show you again where that comes from. So that comes from the model summary table. And again, I've just taken this value here and rounded it to two decimal places. Next, we've got the scatter plot. So I've just said a scatter plot was created to assess the assumption that the variance of the residuals was constant, also known as the assumption of homoscedasticity. And um, in this case, I've just referred the reader to an appendix so they can check the plot themselves. So just to recap, that plot was this one. So this is one we want, where we want to see that there's basically no pattern. Okay, second to last one. So we've got, um, I've set here that a, P, a PP plot was created to assess the assumption that the values of the residuals are normally distributed. And so just to remind you that just means that we created this plot to check that the dots were close to this line. And again, I've just referred the, the reader to an appendix so they can check that out. And finally, Cook's distance, I've said that the Cook's distance value suggests that there were no cases having, uh, that were biasing the model because all of the Cook's distance values were below one. And we've just got that from this residual statistics table where we see that the maximum Cook's value is 0.1. Okay, so probably in reality, I'll report all of these assumptions in, in a single paragraph but I've just uh, spaced them out so that it's a bit easy to see. So now let's go to the reporting the model regression analysis itself. Um, and so I've just specified that we were using the enter method. So that's, um, that's the default method. So that basically, I'll quickly show you. So that just means when this comes up, it says enter here. So that's that's the standard method or it's the uh, default method. And um, that just means that the all the variables are considered at the same time. So you're not specifying that one variable is considered first and then another variable. You're just saying consider all the variables at the same time. Okay. Um, so basically just said why we did this analysis. We did it to investigate whether how far someone lives from campus and how far they live from the nearest train station can be used to predict how often they're late to lectures. And I've said that the model was significant. So that's, of course, a F value here. And that comes from the ANOVA table. So again, just rounding to two decimal places. And then I've got the degrees of freedom value from this bit here. So I've got the two and the 27. If we go back to the example, got 2 and 27, and that's the F value there. And then the P value, which is reported as less than 001, because here we can see that it's 0 0.000, so we just know that it's something less than 0 0.001. And here I've suggested that the model explains 46.4% of the variance, and I've reported the R squared value as 0.46. And so that comes uh, from the model summary table and the R squared bit, so 0.464, you can see that. So after I've reported the results of the, the model, I've reported results relating to the distance, uh, sorry, the specific predictive variables. So I've said that both distance from campus and distance from train station uh, significantly contribute to the model. So if we take a look at distance from campus first, I've just reported uh, the B value, so we've got a 6.6, that is 6.2 here. Just round it to two decimal places again. And we've got the T value here and the P value here. So you can see those there. And we've just done the same thing again for the distance from train station variable. So here's the B value, here's the T value, here's the P value. And those are all reported there. 
that's really all there is to the um, multiple linear regression on SPSS. Hopefully that's helpful. If you have any questions about anything, please let me know. And um, thank you for watching.